Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. 亲爱的各位来宾们、女士们、先生们、媒体朋友们，还有我们的学生朋友们，下午好！欢迎你们来到新经济研究所二零一三年的年会。这一次是特别的年会，因为这是我们第一次来到亚洲。首先，请让我介绍新经济研究所的执行董事 Dr. Robert Johnson. Dr. Robert Johnson 曾经是一位在美国政府的官员，啊，并且是一位世界知名的投资专家。他也曾在联合国，呃，联大会议上为联大主席出谋划策。而更重要的是，现在他是新经济研究所的执行董事。Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Robert Johnson. He was once a U.S. government official for the U.S. Senate Banking, and he was also an internationally renowned investor and fund manager. He was on the Stiglitz Committee together with top economists to the General Assembly on the Financial Crisis Commission. And most importantly, he is the managing director today for the Institute of New Economic Thinking. Let's welcome Dr. Robert Johnson. Good afternoon, and welcome to the fourth annual INET plenary conference, where we explore whether or not there is a changing of the guard. I ask many people, what do you think when we say changing of the guard? And they say many different things. Some of the young people say it's far overdue for the older generation to pass the baton to the younger generation. And I have some sympathy for that, given the problems that our generation has created. Others talk about the move from the developed to the emerging market economies as the source of leadership. Within the intellectual sphere of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, we talk about a move from a cold and mechanistic economics to a more humane economics that reflects the challenges of the present and the future. I come here today very, very inspired by our new partnership with the Fung Global Institute. Victor Fung, his brother William, Andrew Sheng, who is, I would say, he has lighted up INET conferences in years past. And to be working with you as a teammate, Andrew, is, is an extraordinary privilege. Mike Spence, who sits both on our academic advisory board and is the head of the academic advisory board here, has uh, inspired me even further because his two children, Alexander and Chiara, are here as our youngest INET scholars, and they give us all a reason to be very, very excited <laughs> to represent them and to be stewards of your future. INET, since its inception, has really been embarked on a, on a program to build community, to build community to strengthen the courage of individual scholars who aspire to make a difference, who aspire to break from the traditions that were deemed as orthodoxy. And that process, the network of amplification, the number of affiliated institutes, whether at Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard or Berkeley or in Chile or Russia or India or here in Hong Kong, is it ongoing and it's a growing process. And we hope to continue that energy and that momentum with partners like the people here at the Fung Global Institute, like our original partner, uh, CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, where Tom Burns, the former director, stood with me at King's College, Cambridge, on about one day's notice to launch this endeavor. And he's been there every step of the way, along with uh, Paul Jenkins and uh, their new director, Rohit Madura. 
At this juncture, though, INET has to turn the page, perhaps in honor of the name Institute for New Economic Thinking. There's a certain burden that comes with that name, a burden to produce new economic thinking. And what I would say is the next phase of INET will not be what you might say, the institute of anything goes and criticize the mainstream, but it's actually a period of critical inquiry where we have to deepen our perspective, we have to deepen our scrutiny, and instead of just being critics and being accused of potentially being destructive and nihilistic, we have to engage in the much more formidable task of creating that new vision in these new circumstances. It's in that respect that I'm very excited that INET and its partners could convene here in Asia. Since the time of the Asian crisis in 1997, I have sensed, particularly with regard to financial economics, a certain skepticism about what you might call the orthodoxy that emanated from the East Coast of the United States. The sense that I have is that INET perhaps should follow the lead of a great American whose name was Miles Horton. Miles ran something called the Highlander School. He was a brilliant PhD from the University of Chicago, and he chose to go to Tennessee where there were great troubles as the mines were closing, and he chose to listen for two years. He chose to let the environment educate him as to what the problems were. He did not come to, to arrogantly put his expertise down on top of them. He put his expertise in service of them. And I see while INET in its in first three years in many ways was working in this uh, resistance to the citadel of mainstream economics, which we thought had gone stale. We now have an opportunity to work with regions of the world on problems that have no precedent. In particular, I think of the question of sustainability and environmental economics and the interface between that challenge and the notion that pollution anywhere hurts people everywhere, and also the notion that we are not all at an equal stage of development. So you see many from the West will come to an emerging region and scold them about the choice of energy that they use, even though the United States uses roughly double the energy consumption as measured in BTUs per capita of the world average and four times the energy consumption of the Chinese people or the Indian people. So we have a very uh, important challenge. I won't call it a blank slate, but we have a very important challenge as you try to integrate, integrate sustainability, the amount of energy use, growth, where the developed countries have a large debt overhang, and the emerging countries are starting from a much lower level of per capita income. And left to itself, I don't see that markets will necessarily make the right decision. I think this is a very, very formidable challenge. The sense I also have is that there is a, a Chinese tradition, perhaps it's symbolized in the Chinese medicine herbal medicine, acupuncture, and others, which understands that the body must be treated in a holistic approach that improves the overall condition. And we are now in a connected world where the body has many organs in many regions, but they affect the health of the entire planet. I think the economics profession, which emanated from a religion in the United States that one might call the religion of liberty is struggling. And it would be nice to believe 
that there is a Darwinistic process that weeds out bad ideas. But I do not believe that there is such a Darwinistic process. Bad ideas can last for a very long time. Sometimes they are sponsored by the powerful and they become resilient because of the financial resources that are brought to their amplification and repetition. In other instances, ideas that are bad ideas are emotionally gratifying, and people do not discard them because they feel good even if they are untrue. Let me describe one from the United States. There was an author named Horatio Alger, and we adopted a mythology in America that has some very positive characteristics, which is the Horatio Alger myth suggests that if you work hard, you put your head down, you stay focused, you will succeed. And that encouragement to be disciplined and hardworking and well-educated is a very positive contribution. But there is a lie embedded in the Horatio Alger myth. The lie is that if you do those things, you can control your own fate. Many people learned during the financial crisis that they had stayed in school, they had worked hard, they had changed jobs, they had been disciplined, they had been financially disciplined, and then they lost their house. They lost their job. They were not in control of their own fate. I personally would like to be in control of my own fate. I find a certain attraction to the ratio alger myth, but it is not the basis on which to formulate a society. Nor is it the basis to formulate a global financial system based on the myth that we can all see infinitely far into the future to the equilibrium and the stability point. I would dare say if you read the leading financial thinkers who have actually made money, people like our founder George Soros or Warren Buffett or Seth Klarman, they understand that the essence of the challenge is that you cannot see into the future that non-routine change, that what Frank Knight called radical uncertainty, is at the center of a process. And yet, even after Robert Schiller of Yale University produced a paper in the American Economic Review which said, if you apply all of these fundamental models to the United States stock market, you can explain less than one-fifth of the variance. So instead of going after that other 80% of the volatility, we designed financial regulatory systems that were fragile, were not resilient, based on the mythology that these equilibrium, stable, which you might call uh, mathematically precise markets could be measured and could be managed. I think as we talk now, between East and West, between the United States and China, there are other elements that have to be called into question. Our reliance in the West on democracy implies a certain quality of knowledge and participation. And it implies an immunity to the methods and techniques of propaganda that Sigmund Freud's nephew Edward Bernays developed that many, many people, uh, Adam Curtis of the BBC has talked about in his documentary, Century of the Self, which is four parts about the evolution of psychological manipulation. The whole existence of Madison Avenue. Uh, all of these things testify to these capacities and these capacities to manipulate politics and yet, neither the dogmats, dogmatists surrounding the virtues of democracy or economists studying consumer theory seem to have any place for the, what you might call, development of desire. Interactively, the capacity of one person to persuade or manipulate another. It's as if George Orwell never existed. At this conference, you'll see some work 
some new work, uh, working toward what I think is perhaps one of the most fundamental contributions that INET can make, a new model of psychology. The new models of psychology, there's work going on at the Max Planck Institute in conjunction with the Kiel Institute in Germany and INET. There is work that we'll feature in this conference based on the work of the great literary theist R Rene Girard at Stanford. And these openings to a re-envisioning of the individual will place that individual in the context of an interdependent society and will, I believe, drastically alter the way people come to perceive how to structure a social system. As we move into this more critical phase, what I call the period of critical inquiry, I also want to underscore that economists and experts are a public good. And yet, perhaps humorously or ironically or tragically, when they do tests, laboratory tests, economists tend not to find the cooperative equilibrium in a game theory nearly as often as the general public. We have to be careful about what we're teaching ourselves. To, it's almost as if we're in, uh, how say, injecting cynicism and limiting the possibilities that we can achieve through the mainstream economic teachings. I look at the sensibilities that economists have, the propensity, which you might say, to maintain silences, the propensity to avoid conflict or be deterred from examination on critical questions when they know that the implications would imply that they would tangle with the powerful and they perhaps would, would suffer as a result. Anthropologists will tell you that it's the blind spots that reveal the contours of power in the society. It's the silences that are the roadmap. And I've, I've thought about this quite a bit and how corrosive it is to society and corrosive to the spirit. And in the Indian philosophical and religious traditions, in the book, the Bhagavad Gita, the god Krishna tells the warrior, Arjuna, that there are both divine and demonic forces within each individual. And one of the demonic forces that is very powerful is the notion of addiction to negligence. That type of avoidance that I talk about, that, that tolerance of the silences. But what the God tells the warrior about these silences is that they become corrosive of the spirit. And what happens is that people do things like medicate themselves. Use of drugs, use of alcohol, overeating. They're coping with the lack of wholeheartedness that they've been intimidated into adopting as their persona. It was on this day, 46 years ago, April 4th, at the Riverside Church in New York, that perhaps the greatest American of my lifetime, in my own opinion, Martin Luther King, gave a speech which was called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence. And Dr. King, in that speech, spoke about all of the things that led him to be addicted to negligence, led him to focus on the narrow. And he said to the audience, I understand that other people in the civil rights movement fear that if they follow me in opposing this war, that even the white liberal organizations will cut off funding for civil rights. But I also understand that 
I am asking young, angry, abused African Americans in the cities, now this is 1967, Newark, Watts, Detroit, the big riots, I'm asking these people to be nonviolent. And at the same time as I'm asking them to be nonviolent, I am tolerating violence through my silence in Vietnam. Dr. King spoke of the fierce urgency of now. He spoke of the cost of delay, that in societies that are dynamically evolving, there is such a thing as being too late. And when I came here, the, re the reason I'm taking you on this tour of Dr. King's thinking is because when I came here, I experienced a conflict within me. To come to a foreign country and a region where I don't intuitively or perfectly understand very deep elements of their culture and history. I felt a nervousness. I felt as though I would only be here for three days and you live here. And people like the Fung Global Institute are my friends and I don't want to harm them and I don't want to embarrass them. I'm tempted by silence. But when I think about the young scholars who are here, and I think about stewardship, and I see these two young people to my right, and I think about you as my friends, I am conflicted as to whether that silence is friendship. And in my own mind, as we begin this conference, I raise this because I want, I don't know what to do, but I want to ask you to consider that conflict and what is our responsibility and our duty to each other in the world. These organizations, CG, the Open Society Foundation, the Fung Global Institute, are giving us all a tremendous opportunity and my feeling is that if we remain or allow ourselves to become addicted to negligence, we will not realize the promise that we can, and we will not let the world be what these children deserve. Thank you very much. Uh, Lord Sainsbury, Lord Turner, Mr. Soros, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of our co-hosts INET and CG, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this much-anticipated event in Hong Kong. Many of you have traveled very far to be here. To you, I extend a very special and warm welcome to our city. Many local participants have forgone a holiday weekend in Hong Kong uh, to join us. So I hope all of you will participate in what promises to be a path-breaking interchange of ideas and views about the new directions of economic thinking. As you all know, we are emerging into a complex and confusing time with compasses that are no longer guides and they really do not work and we really need to think about how to deal with the future. I commend Rob Johnson and in INET for their foresight in bringing their fourth annual plenary conference to Asia, and in particular to Hong Kong, and challenging all of us with the thought-provoking question, 
changing of the guard, our conference theme. This meeting in Asia is not about Asian triumphalism, which is neither inevitable nor preordained, but about the meeting of hearts and minds, East and West. Yes, after 250 years of Western economic preeminence, which is likely to continue in our lifetime, the East is once again a hemisphere of growth and dynamism. But it was as though it was, but it was through the interchange of open markets and open minds that this happened. That has created what we have today, a truly global century. We have much to learn from each other, and I sincerely believe that it is through the diversity of views, opinions, and analytic tools that we will create something better to explain the complex world that we live in. When Andrew Sheng broached the idea of uh, the Fung Global Institute collaborating with INET for this event, it made perfect sense to me. INET generates new thinking on global economic issues. The Fung Global Institute's mission is to bring Asian perspectives into the global dialogue about the future, primarily through our research into Asia's growth models, finance, sustainability, and our research into global supply chains. We see the world in interconnected, interdependent networks, as this meeting today is also a network of knowledge and thought leaders. Like INET, the FGI is a relatively new organization, established in extraordinary times amid deep questions about the models, systems, and mindsets that brought the world into the 21st century. If the Fung Global Institute is a toddler at less than two years old, INET is at three and a half. It's really more like a preschooler, and there is much that we would look up to. For each of us, as think tanks born in the 21st century, I believe our youth is our key advantage. For the issues of today and tomorrow cannot be solved with yesterday's thinking. We need breakthroughs new paradigms that adapt to a dynamically changing environment. What are the questions that we should be asking? What are the risks and opportunities that we are missing? All these literally means breakthroughs through the ceiling of ideas that trap us in an unsustainable present and creating bold new thought paths to an unmapped future. This event brings together many of the brightest and wisest minds from around the world, from academia, business, policy, and civil society. We all get together in search of new and truly global solutions to global problems. These are exactly the goals of the Fung Global Institute, INET, and the Center for International Governance Innovation. I am particularly happy to see so many participants joining this conference through INET's Young Scholars Initiative. And I'd just like to say hello to all of you watching from a remote location or on the web. The most important changing of the guard is surely about the changing of generations, when one new generation of leaders are about to take over from the old. This is why we should do, this is why we should and do bring the young minds in for we, the stewards of our generation, must provide the next generation with the tools and resources to deal with the future we all aspire to create. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, Hong Kong is well known as a place where we work hard and play hard. We have much work to do, so let me wish you all a successful, stimulating and inspiring conference. And also, I would hope that you have some time left to also enjoy yourself in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Colleagues and friends, um, although I'm from halfway around the world, um, the Fung Glo Global Institute has already made us feel so much at home
that I'd like to join my colleagues, uh, Rob Johnson and Victor Fung, in welcoming you all and us all to this conference here in Hong Kong. Uh, and in doing so, um, make, just make three points that I hope illustrates why we're here and why CG uh, was attracted so early uh, to INET and, and, and to this family. And the first point I'd make is something that my colleagues have already said but bears repeating, that the issues we face are more complex than they've ever been in several dimensions, size, scale, scope. And if someone asked me what might be the three uh, big challenges in global governance, uh, and you all might disagree, but my top three list might be um, getting financial systems right, getting natural resource management right, especially water, and getting intellectual property right. And if you think about how complex it is to design systems that govern these issues nationally, and then think about the globalized world and think about how much more complex the issue becomes if you want to deal with these issues globally, then that gives you a sense of the kind of challenge we all face. So that's, that's just one thought. Uh, my second point would be if we want to make change, effect change in these or any other areas, what might be the elements of change? Uh, now, if you think about the most recent crisis uh, in finance and economics that began uh, some years ago, uh, to be sure, um, we did not have perhaps the intellectual tools, and to some extent the discipline of economics was not up to it. But there were other factors as well. There was groupthink, and there was also institutional capture. And so if you want to make a difference, not only do you need good research and good analytical capacity and good tools, but you also need to think in these other dimensions of, of creating a generation of new thinkers. That, by definition, takes time. Uh, working with institutions that will make a difference and ultimately changing policy. Uh, this is exactly where and how CG comes in. Uh, now, I wouldn't pretend ever that research alone makes a difference, but when CG was created about 12 years ago, we were still in what we might call the G7 world. Uh, we now live in a G20 and rapidly complexifying world. Uh, we needed not just the research and what it might be that a leaders level G20 might do, but also how to move that idea forward. So we need good analytics and we need, we need good communication and we need to know what the contact points and pressure points are. And my third thought is that we live in a highly networked age, which is why we're all here. Uh, as Victor Fung pointed out, good ideas don't get created just there and get moved just there. Uh, we no longer live in a world in which any particular region or discipline has a monopoly on good ideas and good knowledge. We live in a world in which what will ultimately make the difference is how that knowledge is translated across cultures, across time, across space, and especially across different ways of thinking. Uh, if we look at the program that the co-sponsors have created, uh, I hope it touches on many of these points and that if we were having this conversation three days from now, that we're all much wiser than we have now been. Uh, networked age also means that we're all in it together, that CG, INET, the Fung Institute, and indeed all the institutions that all of you represent will be jointly creating solutions, sometimes coherently, sometimes incoherently, but always for the global good. And so I quite look forward to what is to follow. Thank you very much. Don't worry, I'm the last uh, uh, before, before your lunch. And I'm really here uh, uh, just as the chairman of the governing board of INET, uh, mainly to thank uh, Victor Fung and the Fung Global Institute, CG, uh, and also uh, INET's founding uh, donors, George Soros, Jim Belsilli, uh, Bill Janeway, uh, for making this event possible. Uh, four years ago, 
when I first discussed with George Soros the idea of bringing together a group of unorthodox economists who were willing to challenge the uh, conventional wisdom, the failed conventional wisdom of 2009. Uh, what I had in mind, at least, was something a little like the uh, famous Solvay conferences in the physical sciences in the early 20th century, uh, which brought together people like Einstein, Max Planck, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, uh, Marie Curie into a small group of 20 or 30 people to challenge what was going on. Well, what I didn't realize is that with George, when one talks about numbers, one always has to multiply by 10, 100, if not a billion. Uh, here we are, uh, about three or 400 of us at this fourth uh, plenary conference of INET. Uh, just to remind you how far we've moved, let's think back to the first conference, which was in Cambridge, where the first revolution against classical economic orthodoxy was really launched. Then in the second conference, we moved to Bretton Woods, where that revolution, in a sense, was put into practice. In the third year, we tried Berlin, the bastion of economic orthodoxy today. Well, we were less successful in changing that orthodoxy so far. And now here we are in Hong Kong, the gateway to the new economy of the 21st century. Here in Asia is where new economic ideas are being put into practice every day, uh, from uh, active macroeconomic management uh, to the sort of micro experiments in urbanization, energy and environmental sustainability, and the study of wealth distribution that the Fund Global Institute uh, has set up to uh, investigate. Uh, Victor Fung was telling me in the green room a few minutes ago of the way that he and his firm, uh, he was not actually conscious of this, this was the gloss that I put uh, on it really, over the last 30 years has been putting into practice Adam Smith's ideas about the division of labor with the beginning of the assembly plans for transistor radios in China as soon as the Chinese economy opened up in 1978-79, putting them into practice and combining them with the insights of the 20th century on effective, on the management of effective demand, which is what the Chinese government has been doing, combining the ideas of microeconomics from the 18th century with the macroeconomics of the 20th. But the challenges to economics go well beyond that mere combination of traditional microeconomics with our 20th century macroeconomics. Uh, the future is not just about demand management or financial sustainability. It's about environmental sustainability, about wealth distribution, about the relationships between consumption and human welfare, uh, about the growing competition between and the, uh, the inconsistencies between individual decision making and collective requirements. In short, as we see here in Asia more clearly than anywhere else in the world, the demand for new economic thinking and the age of exciting economics has only just begun. And with that thought, please enjoy your lunch and we'll have our panel in about 30 minutes. Thank you very much.